You're listening to Nags in Monroe versus the podcast, and we're here to be the big podcast. And that is the... just get right into it uh my guest for today is scott carson scott how you doing sir i'm honored to be here man uh just absolutely great to always be on another fellow austin podcasters podcast right yes sir well tell me about your podcast how did you start it how did you get into podcasting you know i met you was fortunate enough jesus was it it was this year where there was a podcast meetup and you were like a locker room leader in that in that meetup and i was like i gotta get to know this guy he seems to know what he's doing (laughs) Well, you know, I got started, I've been doing video and, and webinars and conference calls for over a decade now in, in our line of work. And so the last 12 years, I've uh, really kind of focused on the niche of real estate uh, and buying distressed debt. And I found one of the best ways to do that was to share what I was doing because it was such a small niche. So I would share it through Facebook videos and you know, conference calls with our students and stuff like that. And then, you know, we've been doing Zoom webinars. I mean, we've got thousands of videos on Vimeo on YouTube. But it goes back to actually hearing Kevin Harrington, one of the Shark Tank guys in an event in Vegas mm-hmm. uh, in November 1st, uh, 2016. He talked about video. You got to do video, everything video. So we started doing videos and Facebook Lives for roughly about eight months. And then we uh, had built a good following through Facebook and, and YouTube and said, okay, Let's do a podcast. I was actually kind of anti-podcast because I was like, oh, it's going to be a lot of work. I don't have time to edit. I'm so busy. And luckily for me, I got a buddy that does a, a lot of that. And he's like, no, we can do it all for you. And I'm like, okay, great. What do I have to do? You just keep doing what you're doing. Just send us the links. And so I was unwilling to be a podcaster at first, but I'm glad I did. Biggest advice I could tell anybody out there is to start sooner. Yeah. <laughs> And I've just been just basically kind of cranking out episodes. We just recorded episode 625 today. Congratulations. Um, th- thank you, sir. Yeah, we, we crank out three to five episodes a week in our niche. Um, we've spawned two other, three other podcasts off of what we do in, in little niches. And, uh, you know, we, we've grown it to almost a million downloads. And we've now got the podcast nationally syndicated on, on radio across the country as well for the last year and a half now. So, um just, just we show up and we deliver, man. Just like you, man. Show up and deliver. Labor of love to our listeners and our audience and give, give, give. Give, give, give. It's, it's such a cliche, you know? Anytime you want to hear, like, the best advice, it's always, <clears throat> excuse me, it's always show up, be the first to show up, be the last to leave, give more than anybody else could expect, just do it. But, I mean, those are cliches for a reason, and I think we keep passing that on to the, the next generation for a reason, um, you know, and, and that's the key. You know, I've asked an, an incredible people who are masters at their craft, people in marketing, people who work with giant brands like Pepsi and Toyota and things like this. And they always, I always ask them, what's the secret? I want to know. How do you scale? How do you grow? How do you be big? How do you reach a million downloads? And then, you know, you can get syndicated in the radio. How does this happen? And they always tell me, know your audience and consistency and it's so cliche it makes me want to roll my eyes because it's like okay then why doesn't everybody do it so let me ask you scott and your experience how come everybody doesn't do it the reason not everybody does it <laughs> is it Good takes call. a little work <laughs> yeah you know and it, it's it's the showing up and a lot of times i think what you have to realize it's kind of that whole Field of dreams scenario. People believe if you record it, the money will come. Yeah. You know, if you, rec- I'm going to be a podcaster with sponsorship right at the bo- bo- right at the door, just like Joe Rogan. You know, I'm going to sign a hundred. Look, Joe Rogan's one of those offsets. You know, three broke queens is another offset with things like that. You know, mm-hmm. the Will Ferrell, the Ron Burgundy podcast. Those are all great things, but they're all the outliers That's for right. the most part. And podcasting is made up of individuals that show up like you, like me. We gut it out. We're showing up on a regular basis and honestly i hate to say that it's just that you have to realize that whatever you're doing if you're doing it as a passion project or you're doing it something in line with what you're doing you have to realize that it's going to take time you've got to plant some seeds and you've got to be patient and i think patience 
is a virtue these days that a lot of people don't have because of the instant gratification that we get with phones and likes and social media. Oh, what? I didn't get a million downloads. I only had 20 downloads or I had two downloads and mom listened both times. You know, mm-hmm. um, you have to realize it. And here's a big thing. When your mother listens to your podcast, it does not count. Now, when she listens to my podcast, it counts as a true download. That's a good point. But, I like you that. know, that's that, that's the thing. Just being patient. Understand what's what it's going to take. Talk to the people that are at where you want to be and they'll tell you the same thing. Hey, just show up on our regular, be consistent and and listen to your audience don't try to you know swap out a quick buck and you'll abuse your audience but just be truthful because people can re- hear bs they can see it these days now more than ever people don't want to be sold to they want to be educated they want to share something with commonality and that's what i love about podcasting knives is it's really the last bastion of free speech out there yeah. you know and, and and be able to connect with things And in today's society, when we have such big divisions across the board, whether it's Democrat or Republican or ages or whatever, I think podcasts bring our tribe together and can share great things. It can can bring people together. It also can drive people apart. So you got to be careful on what you're doing. You're not you have to realize that not everybody is a listener Mm -hmm. and realize that's the that's the audience that you serve as your true listeners, not everybody. And then the sooner you can get happy with whether it's 5,000 or 10,000 or a million, whatever it is, it's going to take some time to grow. But that's the biggest thing is understanding and serving your niche and, 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 and watering those seeds and watching them grow over time. Just give it time to grow. That's true. You know, um, I'm guilty. I've been doing it for four years, but I have not been consistent. Uh, this year, I've crushed it. I've been very consistent. But that's when I've seen the most growth, right? right. It's, like, it's like getting a six-pack or, or working out. You know, you can't just do it January 1st. Uh, and I, I really want people to, to know that and, and appreciate it because uh, I have a lot of aspiring filmmakers, content creators, creatives that listen to this show. And that's the secret sauce. You know, you have to be good for sure. You have to be good. Yeah. But if you're a good listener, you'll know if you're not good or not. Right. Because that's that'll be the mm-hmm. feedback that you get. I'm curious, Scott, uh, and feel free to be as candid as you like or tell me to go fuck myself if you want. You know, if it's too personal, I don't want to pry. But I am curious. Your main gig for you know how you pay your bills that's that's real estate do i understand that yeah we are in a niche of real estate and we're buying debt is what we do that's my main nine to five i guess you could say i've been doing that and being an entrepreneur real estate entrepreneur for over almost 20 years now coming from the mortgage industry but since everything hit the fan back in 2008 i stopped on the mortgage broker side and then started buying debt so i buy mortgages direct from banks where people haven't usually paid in five six or twelve months Oh. And uh, we buy that debt at a discount with the whole goal in mind to reach out to them and say, listen, I know you've been behind. Something bad happened. I don't care what it is. We like to keep you in the house. Let's it, let's create a win-win here. We'll let you stay in the house. But you know pay, you know stay. You know what I mean? You got to try to work with me here. Uh, we buy that debt at a big, discount, a big discount, usually 50 cents on the dollar of what's owed. And that gives us a lot of flexibility to work with a borrower to keep them in their house and modify their loan. So I've been doing that for years, closed on thousands of deals and uh thousands you know, I'm, I'm of ex- deals wow congratulations yeah. man that is not an easy feat i always tell people because i i tried sales for 90 days that's how long i i could hack it right and i i died man it was like death every day like i am not that person i am weak i'm a big fat loser when it comes to sales like that's not that's just not one of my skills but i tried it you know because i wanted to give it the old college try I made two deals in six months. It was so difficult. And then you meet a master sales person and holy crap, they're like an alien. You're like, I don't have what this guy has. So I always tell people, go, go, go make $1. $1 is hard. And then you want to be a millionaire? Like, dude, sales is hard. Go ask someone for a dollar. It is way harder than you think. So much, much props, sir. That's, that's incredible. The reason why I ask, and I was very curious and I'm sorry to cut you off. Is, nope, you're good. is simply because how big does your podcast need to get where that's your that's your main gig? You know, you could teach people that, how to do what you do. You can go into education. You can go in monetization of information and go into courses. And you're you're a thought leader in this little uh, genre of ours. So how big would this need to get? Or do you have a true passion with, with real estate? So I, don't get me wrong. I love I love real estate. I love helping people. I've you know, I went to college, originally in college, to be a sportscaster. I could so, tell. You look like one of those guys. 
<laughs> rumbling, dumbling, stumbling, whatever. But Love it. you know, the, the podcasting side of things allowed me to kind of, I guess you could say, itch that proverbial itch that I really enjoyed, you know. Um, but I, I, we already did with our podcasting. We, we've monetized it with a couple sponsors, but we, mon- it, use it, we use it to help us monetize our educational platform because we do teach workshops on what we do. We have coaching. We have different seminars or online summits we've been doing for years. And so it, uh, our podcast has turned into actually one of the, the number one revenue generating resources for that is people hear our podcast or they check out the, our uh, videos on YouTube from the podcast. And so we get a lot of people that have say, oh, I've, I've been following you for three to six months and now I'm ready to do something. I'm like, okay, great. And, and that goes back to what you said. I know that my thing isn't like, hey, buy now, buy now. It's a nurturing mm-hmm. process of, of taking time and people realizing that I'm not full of hot air or just trying to get a buck. I'm actually delivering and I care how they succeed. And I think that's, that's the thing about sales. People can sense when you are down on your luck and you need a buck. And the idea that the most successful salespeople are those that really do care, but don't come across like, I got to close this deal. Don't get me wrong. There's been months and weeks where like, I got to close this deal yeah. uh, to, to keep the lights on or to put uh, food on my table. But the point comes down to this. The more you show up, the easier that stuff becomes. And the valleys now are, are higher than the peaks ever were years ago. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. um, I mean, we, we generate a lot of sales. We generate a lot of, of activity from our podcast so it's really kind of our number i won't say it's drawn even with what we make in real estate at all but it's become two years ago we basically became our number one lead gen and marketing source i'd like to say wow that's something you probably couldn't even have imagined at episode one right that (laughs) wasn't even that wasn't even possible so how do you let me ask you scott how do you win how do you win Uh, here's the way i one don't give a fuck. <laughs> yes, sir. Time. Yes, you sir. Know what I mean, mm-hmm. you're not going to make everybody happy. And that's the one of the, I think the hardest things for most people to realize, especially in today's social media, we could have a million likes is that one derogatory person that leaves a bad comment or makes fun of what you're wearing or how you look. And there are, I had a mentor of mine, Greg Reed, a couple of years ago, really instilled something. Actually, it's, looking back, it's about 10 years ago. He shared with me the, the, um, the philosophy of the 33 rule. If you look at your database, you look at your social media, a third of your audience is your friends, your families, the people that like, they follow, they love you. That's great. On the opposite side of the spectrum, you have a third of people out there that hate you no matter what. They have a dark soul or dark hole for a soul. Okay, They're unhappy with life. It doesn't matter what you do. It comes from a, a, a point of jealousy or hatred, or they have something going on more likely than anything else that's affecting their stuff. That's right. And so we as entrepreneurs and we as marketers, because we're all in media these days, have to realize not everybody's our audience, and you have to work on making that 33% that love you happy, and then that middle ground, that middle bucket of people that don't know you that are on the fence. Mm. If you, you, you stick to that, you'll be a lot happier. If you forget and, and develop a little bit of a thicker skin, forget that one person that said something nasty to you, I know it's hard to do it initially because it's you like well, I want to be liked. I want to be loved by everybody. Yeah, but it's physically impossible unless you're grandma. Okay, and even grandma's got some haters. Okay, <laughs> man, really well put. Dang, I like that. I like that a lot. How do you not give a fuck? It's hard. It's hard. I'll tell you that we've had we've had some things that have been great, and we've had other things that just went south. I mean, in real estate, with what we do. We have a lot of great deals. We have a lot of singles and doubles, and we have deals that just some good sell. So you're gonna have people that are upset about things. Here's here's the best thing I can tell you: is you have to surround yourself with people that like and trust that you like and trust, mm-hmm. and you also need mentors. You need people that have gone through it because another one of my mentors told me, "Hey, when you start having haters, it means you're doing something right. Yeah, because you'll never ever have somebody who's above you in skill level or experience." say something bad about you for the most part. Yeah. It's always somebody that's at or beneath you that is jealous or upset about things. And so you have to you have to take that with a grain of salt and realize, okay, something's going on. I have to, just to give some love. Even though there's times you want to say, go F off yourself or go to the, that's the worst thing you can do in this, such a polarizing society and, and online thing. So the best, the best way is just to show up every day, realize that you've got a longer picture, pray for those people if you're religious or wish them well block them and just keep cranking out and moving on because you're helping there's a lot of people out there that you're helping in some sort of fashion that aren't commenting and 
you have to realize it's the same thing. If, if you like a restaurant, you'll tell three or four friends. If you hate a restaurant, you'll tell 14 or 15 people you dislike it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Word of so mouth. Just keep, it's real. Yeah. I mean, just keep showing up. You're going to have good days and bad days and realize um, that we're not in any type put into any type of situation that we aren't being prepared for. And it'll come out a lot better in the long run. If you give in to being negative back, it just creates a bigger, bigger mess. And the best thing you should, is, I hate to say this, but take the high road as best you can and just keep cranking out stuff. What would you say, um, consistency obvi obviously is a tenant. We need to do that. That's a virtue. Consistency, we can't take that out of the equation. But how do you manage, and I struggle with this, so brief brief anecdote on me. I have I come from filmmaking world, right? So. Mm -hmm. It, it, it did not prepare me for content creation on the internet because the whole right. idea was to spend a year, two years sometimes, to make a 90-minute product and then sell tickets, promote that product, and put asses in seats and then use that word of mouth to replicate that to two theaters, 10 theaters, and so on. That was the school I came from. Now, I'm very familiar with video and audio like you, and I'm able to translate yep. that and help people and so on into, say, TikTok or Facebook or what have you, what we're doing here. And then there's this idea, okay, consistency, I totally get that. And then there's this idea of quantity, right? So you do three or four episodes of your podcast a week as someone who, man, I must have did a podcast every day for 30, maybe 45 days in a row. And that's intense not every one of them is a banger but then you do one that you would have never done otherwise that resonates with people right so how do you balance quantity you know like how much is too much is there such thing as too much and and how do you basically create enough material to generate that content those are really good great questions and i'm glad you asked that because i get that all the time when people hear that we crank out that many episodes and it comes down to a couple of things. One is we start the day off marketing. Every day has got to start off marketing. So a, an ep, a podcast episode becomes our hour long of marketing. Either it's that day as we're live streaming it or the next day when it goes out on social media platforms as a replay or a week or two later when it comes out as a, a blog or the audio episode on iTunes or whatever. Okay. So we're planting seeds every day to start that off. That's our number one thing. Let's start with marketing first because that leads to a lot of things. Let's, whereas a lot of people... They wait to the end of the day yeah. for marketing when they're you know they're tired or worn out. Can't do that. Here's the other thing too, nice. Mm, if I had smart. to do all the editing myself, yeah. I would never. I wouldn't do three to five episodes a week. Yeah. Okay. So that's the big thing. I would maybe be one or two episodes a week. So that you have to look at what you're you have. Luckily, we've got some sponsors that cover our our production costs and uh, make it you know it pays for itself with what we do. So that's a big thing. You have to look at what you're. You're right, but initially when we started off, we were still doing three to five and, and just doing videos to build an audience to start driving that stuff in with, with people signing up for things or sponsorships. So just the best thing I can tell you to do is brainstorm. If you see like an FAQ, frequently asked questions on websites or in a niche, that's a great place to start as kind of your your catalog of episodes. Um, you're um, documenting your journey. People love that. And I think it's what the biggest, best thing about podcasts has been is documenting your journey. And that's what I did initially. I would share episodes of how I got started or even before the podcast, I would take videos of me getting calling banks and getting hung up on or <laughs> me walking real estate with a, a remember the little, uh, you may not remember the little Dell cameras, the little flip cameras. Oh, yeah. You know, I'd be out there sweating my ass off in 120 degree Austin, Texas heat in the middle of the summer and, and documenting it and people would crack up at me because, you know, stuff like that. So just, yeah, you, you just got to basically realize, okay, I got to plant these seeds. Yeah, I got to keep doing this on a daily basis. It will pay off exponentially in the long run. But realize if you have a question or you're, somebody's asking a question, they're not the only one and your audience probably is thinking the same thing too. So that's the biggest thing. And then just build, it builds a habit. It's like building that muscle. You know, when you crank out an episode, they don't have to be an hour long. I think my average episode is somewhere around 40 minutes, but we do a lot of smaller ones, 30 minutes or less, and then we do interviews. Hmm. So we started off like our first, really our 50 episodes was just me teaching. Then we started bringing on some guests or vendors in our niche. And now it's roughly about 50-50. 50 
percent of me interviewing people in my field or um, entrepreneurship mindset or business systems along with me teaching uh, on that. So that helps. Uh, don't be wrong. There's times that I've been burnt out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll take a week or two laps and just kind of chill and go there and, and, and try to and, and revamp my energy and figure, okay, what do I need to talk about? But because that's important. Being creative all the time can burn you out really fast, if, if, especially if you're burning it on both ends of the candle. Yep. And a lot of podcasters are up there. So being consistent is all about just making a list and then you're going to have things that pop up. But if you ever go to the, you're, you're dry at the well for a thought, go back to your list and there's your FAQs that you can dive into is an easy way to kind of prime that pump. How do you tap into hunger, right? Like how do you know when you've scratched the itch, you're good, you're satisfied, you're satiated, your cup is full, it runneth over. Like how, I'm 32 years old, I struggle with this now. Like, um, I'm in this weird spot where I never even thought I'd make it this far. Like, I didn't think I'd make it past mm -hmm. 13 or 16. So to even be here, mm -hmm. it's all extra. And I got kids and, you know, they keep me humble. And, uh, you know, they need braces. You got you to gotta work hard for them. I get it. But how do you stay hungry? Like, when I was poor, when I was dirt poor and I had no prospects and I had a chip on my shoulder and I was young and angsty and angry and jaded at the world and I had so much to prove, that hunger, like I've used this metaphor, if I had to paint the picture, hunger for me was like oil on the floor. It, it was just in surplus. It was seeping from the ground. Now today, for whatever reason, I've just lived a wild life these past couple of years. Um, now I got to dig so deep. I got to dig miles deep to just get some oil where it just used to be so plentiful. So do you struggle with that? You know, nobody's perfect. Yeah. Um, but how do you how do you reignite the fire? Yeah, it's, oh man, it's such a great question, and it's honestly networking with others, like the meetup group that we went to and met each other. You know, we exchanged some information, we talked, we you, you hit it off when you're around like-minded people. Um, if you can have a mastermind, you've heard that mastermind is overused in today's society. I'm a big believer, but really, if you can get a group of people, of peers that you you support, and you all kind of I hate to say this, row in the boat in one direction. We're all, and that's what I love about the podcasting world. We all have different destinations we want to get to, but we're all working to go in, in one direction, make ourselves better and get our word out. And so, especially right now, the last six months, being stuck at home for the most part, nice, especially yeah. in the last 30 days, I'm not going to lie, I have had a hard time motivation-wise mm -hmm. because I'm not getting that dopamine of being out and being able to get a high five or, or have a beer with you. Yeah, You know what I mean? This, honestly, I, I've, I get more enjoyment from doing podcast interviews where I can see somebody face to face. Now, I can't go out and, 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 and network with people these days, you know, for the most part. Um, but that's the thing is it, whenever I feel that way, I pick up the phone and I call a mentor. I call a coach. I call somebody that I admire and we just I just talk, you know, hey, I'm, I'm dealing with this right now. You know, what, how did you overcome it? What what can what, what do you think? And sometimes it's, we just got to get that outside you know, a, a view, because sometimes we're so busy banging our heads on the tree, we can't see the forest for what we're trying to do. Yeah. And so if, you, if you're struggling with motivation or, or fire, do yourself a favor, don't record an episode, because it's going to come ac across the board as being angry and bitter. In some cases, pick up the phone and call somebody, have a guest on, um, go outside and yell, honestly. <laughs> um you know, if you listen to, if you're into that mental game and doing stuff, Tony Robbins is great to listen to. We, I'm a big Tony uh, Robbins guy for sure. Okay, I wouldn't, so Prime, I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for that guy. Okay, all right, good. So he did his big UPW, you know, his big yeah. virtual event a few months ago. Thirty thousand people across the country. I sat through it for the first time, even though I've heard stuff. And that's in, the big in thing. In person? Is, no, no, no. It was all online via oh. Zoom. Dude. God, wow. It's so cool. 30,000 people on a Zoom call. For Intense. Five days. Okay. Wow. Sorry, three days. But the thing is, just building some habits, going out there, breathing, getting out. And, and it's a lot of times our energy and motivation comes from our physiology, our movements. And that's a lot of times people have been stuck. So I like to get up and try to go outside and walk in my backyard, look at the vegetable garden that we've planted in the, in the flowers and stuff in the last six months, or get up and just get out the heck out of Dodge. Yeah. Out of the house, that's one of the best things because we have to really un unplug sometimes. Otherwise, yeah. you're just going to be you're going to wear that battery out, and it's going to be like a, one of those lithium ion batteries. You know what I mean? It 
You, you recharge it, and it says it's full, but yeah. it only lasts damn an hour. It's like a damn computer laptop after a year or two. You got to keep yeah. that thing plugged in because it's never going to be charged. So. That's right. Emotion is caused by motion. Yeah. Amen. To hey, oh, there, there we go. There you go. You Hashtag see? TR, baby. That's right. I'm a big Tony <laughs> Robbins guy. That guy saved my life. I, you know, I'm a big pirate, right? So I was a child of the internet. And I, I was like on Napster when I was 12 years old. Like I figured it out. And so I downloaded illegally torrented, allegedly, um, all the Tony Robbins audio stuff. This is pre-YouTube. And as a young kid, I was like, this guy's speaking to me. And so I, I own all his books. I've read them. Um, and anytime I'm, I'm lost, like I kind of go back to the basics, right? So he's always been yeah. there and, and, and I love him to death and I appreciate him for sure. Can you talk to me about, um, a big, fat, juicy failure. The first one that comes to your mind that, that still stings to this day and oh, what you well, learned from it. Oh, okay. So flashback 12 years ago, market here in Austin takes a big dump. Across the country, takes a big dump. Okay, mortgage market meltdown, real estate meltdown. I bought a couple properties that were great, and then in the period of me rehabbing them, they went below what I paid for them. I was up, upside down. So big, big. You know, I had uh, got, went through a divorce, Oof. ended a business partnership, and I was sitting, literally renting a room. I went from living in a five bedroom, four bath, forty four hundred square foot house with me and the dog and a cat to renting a bedroom for $400 a month that I could barely afford. Ouch. Okay. Ouch. And so I knew I needed to change my location. So I was down at my brother's house uh, watching, it was uh, like March, first part of March, 2000 and, uh, 2010. And I was watching, you know, ESPN, da -da -na, da -da -na, and they had those Visa commercials coming out, you know, $6 for a hot dog, $10 for a beer. Going to all the ball games with your son, priceless, right? I was like, oh, I would love to go to that. I'm a big baseball fan. Yeah. So I'm sitting there feeling sorry for myself. I got these two properties that are just arbitrosses. I'm just kind of feeling down. I'm like, I got to get the heck out of Dodge. So I, I literally, you know, they talk about writing down your goals. I said, okay, I want to write it down a goal and try to see 30 leagues. And I said, well, what would it take for me to go to all the major league baseball clubs? So I pulled up the schedule and I applied it all. It take about 30 weeks. 34, 35 weeks to go across the country. And I just wrote it down. Okay. Mm. So, but I put the dates in for like when the Rangers are playing and the Astros and of course the Braves and had this whole fictional kind of thing. Mm. And I was doing marketing. Here's the thing. I was doing still videos about the deals that I was doing and what I was finding and, and going through this kind of like, I won't say this weird time in real estate, but it was a, a real weird time because we weren't had an experience what we were going through. And fast forward about 30 days, I had four real estate investment networking clubs reach out to me who saw my blog, saw my videos, and they asked me if I would come out and speak to their real estate club. And I'm like, when do you want me to come out? And the dates they had on their calendar that were open lined up perfectly when I would be in that city for a baseball game. Wow. To total divine intervention. Okay. So I was like, okay. All right, somebody's telling me something. So I sold everything I had left, basically. Wow. Jump, jumped in my truck. And what that turned in, what I thought would be 30 weeks, turned into three and a half, four plus years of traveling and being on the road by myself. Me and my dog, by the way. Okay, the dog okay look, real park. quick, on that note, traveling by yourself with your dog, John Wick style, did you enjoy that? Or was it? I a loved it. It was. Well, you see, you're a road you're a road warrior like me. There's any, any chance I get for an eight hour drive? I'd rather drive. I'll go. For some reason, well, I'm just I don't like, know if I would drive that much. I get a little stiff these days. I'd rather jump on the, Southwest and fly, and it save me like five <laughs> hours to do get in some more trouble, or at least I could drink for five hours someplace <laughs> fun. You know what I mean? If you got to go to Corpus, Dallas, Houston, the Rio Grande Valley, yeah, yeah. you're gonna drive, right? They, Texas, well, I agree. I told, Texas I is so Corpus big. If, if you're yeah, oh, yeah. awesome, if you're out of state, yeah, of course. You, Texas is so big. You could fit Germany, Denmark, I don't know what else in it. But uh, so I totally feel you. But so you did enjoy, you you know, just not to sidetrack, but you did enjoy that those four years. I huh? loved it. And there is something so liberating about giving up worldly possessions. I mean, I had my truck. I had my dog. I had some clothes. I had a small storage facility unit that I had. It was like 10 by 10 with some stuff in it that I didn't want to get rid of family heirlooms. But it was, I hit it. I mean, I was like, I reinvented myself. And it, it was mm. from this ashes, the phoenix arises out of it that I built this 
nationwide network kind of grassroots network of investors and people and made friends and relationships all across the country to the point that I actually have really more friends. I'm better connected outside of Austin than I am in Austin, if that makes sense. But that it makes was total uh, sense. Absolutely just great. It was just getting out of my head, seeing new experiences, talking to people, um, and, and literally just, you know, the best thing that came out of it was not only this network, but I found the love of my life along the way. She heard me speak somewhere, and boom, um, we've been together for a while. We're not married. We're happy, as I like to say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's, you know, you, you, you sit there, a divorce and financial ruin, almost had to file bankruptcy. That's a lot of people are going through those things right now. Yep. And it can be a tough time and stressful. And it was very stressful and uh, very, very stressful to the point I was like, I don't know if I can make it through this. Yeah. But I was like, I got to keep chucking along. Something's going on here. I don't know what it is. Let me just trust the process. And the process played out well. Scott, how many birthdays have you had? I am, uh, well, how old am I? I'm Carry the I one. My 43rd birthday, 43. Oh, you're a baby. Nine. You're a baby. Oh, yeah, that's 77 awesome. I was born. Oh, that's so cool, man. That is so awesome. It's because you remind me a lot of myself, you know, but we're we're a generation apart, you know. Um, sure. That's incredible. That that sounds a lot like me. You know, the, the woman that I'm with right now, we got two kids. We're not married, but she's my spouse. She's my she's yeah. my everything, you know, so I totally get you. We're in love. Um, let me ask you a selfish question. Um, so at the, at the beginning of the year, my wife and I were, she really wants... I, you know, this is just me. I'm sexist here, so trigger warning. Just kidding, but yeah, I think I think I never desired to own a home. I never really desired it. It was kind of my wife's idea, and she was like, "I don't know how we're gonna do it, but that's something I want to do." And it's the whole adage of you pay five years in rent. That's enough for like a house that you could own, but you're not owning anything. And I'm all about ownership. So she kind of sold me on the idea. And uh, lo and behold, and this is an exclusive. I've never said this on, on my show before because it's kind of like don't count your chickens, right? But yeah. um, we found a, like a developing neighborhood that we liked. I won't say where, uh, just to protect myself. And we started to build a house, and which was really exciting because I came from I'm, – I'm trailer park trash. Like I came from nothing. Like – I didn't get a floor until I, like I was 14 years old. I thought Goodwill was a brand growing up, right? <laughs> and um, so I never really thought I'd get a, a house, a home, like my own house with my, for my kids and my dog. And um, then this COVID shit happened, this pandemic, yeah. you know, fortunately, so blessed by the grace of God that my job was, dare I say, recession proof. And that, you know, you said to yourself, so many people are struggling right now living in their car or worse. And so what are your thoughts just from, you know, you check the pulse every day, I'm sure. Here we are, September 15th, just to, for posterity, just to timestamp this, because we'll look back at this years from now um, and marvel over this time period, because what a crazy time to, to live in a big city and to be an American. Like, this is just the most wild time of my lifetime. What are your thoughts on, on building a house? I'm putting you on the spot right now. Is it weird? We don't need to get into like the technicalities of like interest rates and stuff, but yo, like, isn't this crazy to buy a house right now? Like that's absurd. How can it not be? I'm asking an authority figure it, it, here. The number one, the number one answer to every real estate question is it depends. Okay. And so I'm going to say that it depends if it's, your house and you love it and you've got a, a great deal on it and you're able to afford it affordability that's a beautiful thing keep going because your primary residence is different than if you're an investor okay? true so Very i approach true. things different when you look at your primary home and you've got mama if mama ain't happy ain't nobody happy yep okay yep. that's a whole different animal especially uh coming from the idea of building a nest when you've got kids they want to have kind of that home base and especially with the craziness of what's going on the more you can have your home base and the more safer and secure you'll feel, the better it is for your spouses, your kids, your growing up and stuff like that. Because, you know, I, I bounced around, rented places. And as an individual guy, it's not that big a deal. But when you got two kids and schools and a spouse, it's a whole different model. That's you right. You know what I mean? That's right. So if you're building a house, that's a great thing. Your primary is you got a great deal on it. You got some great things on it. It's affordable. You look at the taxes and everything's going to be affordable, especially in Austin right now. 
Yeah. I would honestly say it's probably the most affordable thing compared to if you're trying to buy something that's been out because we have such a low inventory here in Austin right now. Yeah. And I, I think it's great. I think I don't think there's anything wrong with it at all because if you look at appreciation in the next what's going on right now, these six months or the next six months of this year, yeah, we're gonna have some craziness happen. Yeah. But over scale, you're gonna be in that house hopefully on average at least seven years, seven to ten years for the most part, before mm-hmm. people upgrade or sell. You should see it. You know, your double your house should double in a, in, in value in the next five to ten years. Wow. So for those that aren't investors buying a primary residence and saving what you're saving on rent or what you are paying on equal to rent, you're, you're getting a lot more. Plus the tax write-offs, um, the, the, you know, all the other things that you can do by having a business in an office there and being able to write that off too for you. Having a home, being a homeowner is one of the best tax uh, savings and uh, tax havens that you can have as a, an individual in the United States today. So I'm a, that's a very good response. And I, I you made me feel better. Thank you. I'm going to be a, I'm going to wear my cynical hat. I'm going to be the, I'm going to play the devil. Truth be told in real life, Scott, I'm a, a bit of a punk rocker, right? I was anti-establishment, never dug school. Full disclosure, you know, my wife, she, she got her degree. She, she went, got a higher education. She's got some debt, right? She's got some debt. Everybody wants their, everybody wants to go to college, but you know, nowadays your kids going to college is weird because they're, going to college from home so it's a strange time but i was able to avoid all that and and be fortunate enough to go all in i doubled down tripled down went all in on my skills you know and was able to to make money and i'm i'm lucky um i'm the exception not the rule i think and so what are your thoughts i'm putting on my cynical hat of just uh, deep down inside man there's a voice in me it's like a parasite it's like a worm in my head that tells me this is all this is all for naught, man. Like none of us own anything, man. Like who who are we to say we own land, man? Like I didn't ask to be born, and then I'm gonna say this this is my land. Like wh- what is ownership, you know? And then there's this whole conspiracy theory of like the banks they gotta make money, and so they this is the Grant Cardone thing, right? Of like so the best way. Is to is to sell debt, right? And that's how that's how they eat. And so the best kind of product to create for the banks was like homes, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm on my soapbox, and this is just what I hear. But what are your thoughts on that? You know, like you're an expert in the field. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. I'm asking the hard questions. You know, no, it's good. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on what are your thoughts on your... ownership and and equity and debt and like our relationships with this? Because you know, I told my wife. Right now we have a landlord, but our landlord's going to be the bank. How's that any better? She's like, oh, we get to paint the walls and all that without asking. Sure, but then there's the homeowners association. How's that not like a manager? I don't like people breathing down my neck. It's just the punk rocker in me, man. I'm I'm kind of like you from years ago. Like I got my bags packed and I'm ready to take my dog out on the road. And I'm just fishing poles are in the car like at all times. I'm ready. So what are your thoughts on that? You know, um, with the you know, pandemic, you, you know, uh, it's it's a strange no, I'm time. I'm, I'm wrestling not, with I mean, these I'm thoughts. Op- I'm the op- opposite side. Based on your scenario, I am the evil empire, the bank on the other side, because we buy that. I'm kind of the, your secret agent, though, uh, to make <laughs> things happen. Because we, I would say, we legally steal from the banks. We take their own, you know, their, what the, what they've got going on, and use it against them to find deals and make opportunities. Now, here here's the biggest thing: everybody has a boss. Everybody. Even Jamie Dimon over at Citibank, the number one, you know, biggest bank, ever, he's got a boss. He's got his board or he's got the stockholders. Who's, okay? your, who's your boss? My boss? Because I look be, at you, uh, you're an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur, yep. My boss is still going to be my investors. My boss is going to be uh, the lady of the house, you know? I can or cannot do. Of you course. know, happy wife, happy life, right? Happy spouse. Uh, you're, 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 whatever, I don't can't figure it out. I can't rhyme right now, but... <laughs> I don't, yeah, oh yeah, happy happy spouse don't get doused. She just said down. There, all right, she's a poet. <laughs> she's a poet and didn't know it. Yeah. Um, but that's the thing. I think it's what it comes down to because it, it all depends. Unless you're independently wealthy, and uh, if you've ever watched the movie The Gambler with uh, mm-hmm. Mark Wahlberg. Mm-hmm. Oh, Mark Wahlberg. No, I'm thinking of a different movie. The well, The Gambler, where it's got Mark Wahlberg and uh, what's his oh, name? What's his name? Basically, he's a gambler, and everybody. There's like right. <laughs> Anyway, I know who you're thinking of. John Goodman. John Goodman. Correct. And John Goodman says in there, 
If you own your house and you got two million in the bank, you've got fuck you money. Fuck you, whatever you want to do. I'm good to go. Now we're okay? talking. All right. I love that quote. It's a great quote out there. And here's the thing. You you can try to fight the system. You can try to fight everything. But the idea here is, yeah, you can fight against it, but at some point you're going to get into it. So what you have to do is know the rules of wealth, know the rules of money, and use those rules that everybody's playing by. So it's literally like trying, if you're playing checkers to Monopoly, you're going to get run around. It's literally right. like trying to play Monopoly and then just trying to win the game by going around the board and collecting $200 every time you pass go. Mm-hmm. That's not how the game is played. And that's the, that's the thing you realize. There are rules out there, laws out there, and this is what the wealthy do. They use those rules and those laws of arbitrage, You know, putting money in a bank and a bank paying you 0.1%. And then they're taking that money and lending it in the mortgage loans at 4% or 5%. They're not making three point or 4.9% return on their money. They're making a 490% return on their money and arbitraging the funds. That's right. So you have to understand how the game works yeah. and what you can invest with. A dollar saved is not always a dollar earned. Mm-hmm. Unless you're putting your, do- your dollars out in the market and it's bringing money back above what you're paying towards your debt. So debt's not a bad thing. Because let's say you're the average price home in Austin, let's just say is three, what's three hundred and forty? Unless you got a three hundred and forty thousand mm-hmm. dollars that's right to plunk down, which most people don't, taking out a mortgage at ninety seven percent or whatever you're doing and you're paying three to four percent. Money's really cheap right now. Money is cheap. So you look at what your cost savings per rent or what and adding the taxes to it, you're gonna come out ahead of time in a, in a variety of things. So that's what you have to do. You have to look at both sides of the equation. I mean, look, I, I grew up in a small town called Ingleside, Texas. We weren't wealthy. My dad owned the local hardware store. Entrepreneurship does not mean wealth. Yeah. Okay. Um, you have to realize that you there. One of the best things about what we have here in the country is our access to education, whether it's online or through Lynda.com or the Can Academy. We've had we got more access to education than anybody else out there does. And if you are a hustler, somebody who's self-motivated like yourself out there who can go and find that information, great save you from paying forty thousand dollars a year to become a debt slave for most, you know, mm-hmm. most degrees mm-hmm. these days don't have value. Yeah. Um, what they should deliver. And I think it's illegal for I really think it's bad that these if if you're going to college and they can't get you a job or put you in a degree that's Cost more for the degree than what you're going to make as an income. I think that's a big fallacy. I I happen to agree. Very slick, very slick, sir. I think I agree with you there. Yeah, it's 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 mind boggling to me. And you're totally right about the game, which is why. Um, and I'm not proud of this. I'm saying this, giving absolutely no credit to to these men that I'm about to mention. You know, I come from a long line of drug dealers. My father was a drug dealer. Um, his father was a drug dealer. Uh, my grandpa on my maternal side was was one as well. They weren't very successful, you know. But that's what I'm sure they did what they did because they that was the the game. They knew those rules in that game, and that's what they yeah. played. So if I'm um uh, and I come from uh, I'm Hispanic, and so my parents are um the you know descendants from they're like second generation Americans, right? Uh-huh. So even though Knives Monroe, it's my real name, and you know, I'm quote unquote, I don't like this term, but it is what it is, white passing. I've been afforded different luxuries than the most people, especially the community that I came from yeah. in South Texas, which was a border town. Um, so if I want you to give resources or advice or point to whatever education that you can, if there is a disenfranchised minority person of color, what have you, someone, maybe they come from an immigrant family, they came from Russia, or they come from Mexico, or someplace, and they want to learn the rules to the game, where do they, where do they find them? How do they, how do we trust that? You mentioned the rules of wealth. What are the resources? Why are these, and I think I can understand why, these are like heavily guarded secrets or rules, you know, because they ain't on billboards, right? And there's so many people that are very, entrepreneurs and business people that are very protective with their hand. So where where would you recommend someone who's coming with a disadvantage um, 
to learn the rules of wealth? I would, I would, uh, I would first, the first book I would read or go download it somewhere is Thinking Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. I own right it and, I, and I've read it. Yeah. So it's one of the best books. The Richest Man in Babylon would be the next book I read. Mm -hmm. Um, here, here's a thing. Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki would be another one that I would read. The own it. There. Yeah. That's a good one. You know, the, the, and there's, there's theories in there. Okay. Um, you have to realize you have to break the chain of what you're doing. Most people will say they spend all everything and then they save with what's left over. And if, if you've read those books, you've heard the, the philosophy of pay yourself first. I, I agree with that. Pay yourself five, ten percent first and live on the rest if you can. If you want to go Dave Ramsey and, and talk about that, that's a great thing. I think he's a little extreme in some cases, but that's okay. But here's what you have to realize too, if you're wanting to invest. And that's why I think that's one of the biggest things about immigrants when they come to the United States is they understand the opportunity. Whereas a lot of people that are here in the United States take, take it, don't take advantage of the opportunities that we have. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're comfortable with being a spoke on the wheel. Well, not just a comfortable with spoke on the wheel, but they have a sense of entitlement. Very true. And everybody, everybody, unless you're native American, we're all immigrants. At that's some right. Point. Somebody had to jump on a ship, come here, whether it was, forcefully or you came here for own free will correct all right and there's never been an equal never been a time where you could access as much information as you can right now through podcast through video libraries i mean very true if you, you have to take advantage of those opportunities if you don't then okay then it's on you um that's, we're that's all right. in specific situations because of the decisions we've made on a daily basis Nobody's held a gun to your head. Well, in some cases, we've had. I've been shot at a few times. I think everybody has at some point, depending on what's going on. But what I'm trying to get at here is take the education and then start applying it. Um, people that want to get into real estate investing, here's a great thing. There is millions of dollars sitting out there at local investment clubs of people waiting for a good deal. So if you can go find a deal or a property or something that makes sense, there are somebody out there that will probably give you the money that won't give a rat's ass of what your credit score is or what the color of your skin is or what your, your age is. It's all about, hey, what's the property going to do? Yeah. And that's one of the things that we have done for years is raise capital for our projects from other investors. Mm -hmm. We haven't gone through getting approved of the bank. They haven't had to jump through those hoops. The deal made sense and they were able to fund it. So most people don't realize that there's all this private money sitting out there waiting for somebody to call them up and say, hey, I've got a deal. And you can borrow this money at ridiculously low rates compared to long-term financing for a short term. So that's that's the biggest thing. Realize if you want to do stuff, there's usually funding or financing. And the biggest thing I would tell you as well out there, if you're struggling and there's somebody who's successful in what you want to do, pick up the phone and give them a phone call. Reach out to them on social media. Most of the people, most of my mentors uh, that I've met, if I've met in person or I've talked to them because I just reached out to them. Most of the most successful people in America, out there in the world, want to share their secrets with you. They literally want to help those that are, are less fortunate because they've gone through a bad period. And they would rather help you avoid those hiccups and or speed up that learning curve so that you can take off and you're not, you don't make the same mistakes. Because people don't, in success, they don't see the mistakes. They don't see the the, the failures That's right. out there. And those that are successful are only successful because of the fact they have failed more times than not. Uh, I was a banker originally when I first moved to Austin. Well, back in 2004, I was a, a mortgage banker for mm. J.P. Morgan Chase mm. and opened up like a dozen branches around Austin as Chase is going through an expansion. But one of my clients up here on the north side of town uh, was Mr. Lee. And Mr. Lee actually owned a uh, the restaurant, the Asian restaurant inside of Lake Lane Mall. Mm. And I got to, I got, he'd come in, I was his personal banker and, and other things. We got to talk in and I said, well, you know, he's got all these 10 or 12 chains. He's got a couple houses. Always, I said, how did you, how did you build it? Because well, I started off, most people don't realize that I, I worked in a restaurant like this. I washed dishes and I worked my way up. I saved, I was eventually able to buy the restaurant from the owner, previous owner. And then for five years, I slept on the floor in my kitchen on a grass mat at the end of the night. Five years. Five years. My my wife wanted to do the same thing. So five years, and we had the opportunity. We had saved enough money to either A, buy a house, or B, buy another restaurant or Buy another two. store, yeah. 
and they decided, okay, we're not going to buy a house. We're going to go ahead and sit on the floor. They thought they had to sleep on the floor for another four years. They only slept for another two. But in that time frame, another two years, they bought four more locations. Mm. And so they invested heavily in themselves. They invested, they didn't listen to what the social media or their friends right. and family told them that they couldn't or couldn't do. Right. It, they looked at the numbers, they believed in themselves, and they really rolled up their sleeves and went to work. You know, it wasn't always easy, you know? Um, and that's the thing. I'll, we The whole idea of that, and then the big one of the biggest problems in the United States is the keeping up with the Joneses. You know, I've got to do this because of image, or I got that. I'm like, screw that. You know, yeah. if you want to read a good book, read The Millionaire Next Door. Mm. Um, and The Millionaire Next Door talks about the average – the, the average millionaire drives a late model Ford F-150 white pickup with three dents in it and 100,000 miles. Fascinating. Because they realize they don't need the new, you know, freaking yeah. Cadillac DeVille or whatever it is. They're going to use something. It's a tool that works and it saves them money. It's just a different mentality to get beyond that. So if you're motivated, just read some books, reach out to people. There are great people everywhere. Go to your small business administration office. Talk to somebody who's a... Uh, they have a thing called SCORE there, which is a retired executives in business. There's so many resources. You just got to pick up the phone and say, hey, help me. And most people are glad to help you in any form or fashion out there. They'll say, okay. I want to vouch for that. I think that's very true. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I just, for a micro example, put out there on Facebook, and I was feeling down. I was having a bad day. And I was kind of fishing for some sort of adoration or something online. But I, I had no expectations, and I put out there, does anybody want to talk shit on my podcast or something? And 50 people responded, and I was like, what? And you were one of them. And I was like, I, what? I, I, whoa, like, we need to ask more often. We need to pick up our yeah. hand and say, help more often, you know, or, or be more... Uh, invitational you know we certainly aren't and i think that's very true and i, I want to vouch for that this is a sur surreal time in our country but it is still the land of opportunity for sure so as we're winding down here scott i want to ask you because i just came back from a, a, another interview right before we, we started this one i say i don't do interviews we do we do conversations right yeah but, that's good but i've been asking a lot of questions because i look at you as just a fountain of of wisdom and so i gotta get in i gotta get it all I, I collect all the jewels and the gems and i just try to share them right that's what this podcast is about isn't but, it the beautiful thing about being a podcaster you can interview and pick the brain of people that you, you love and i love i love that about podcasting it's my favorite and, and thing having people on and learning yeah it's my favorite thing i uh what tony robbins would call at the hour of power this is from like the 90s so i don't know if he still says that but um still says it. Still says okay it. good good i'm a big believer in it and uh, had two hours of power today. I was doing some fasted cardio in the morning and from 6 a.m. And it was still dark. The sun didn't come out to like 6.45. And anyway, so I'm, I'm breaking a sweat. And you know, emotion is caused by motion. And, and it's great. And I do it to clear up the mind. I do it. Mm -hmm. It's all mental for me. The physiology, it's great. But it's all mental. And the brain is physical after all, right? So a new a new something, a new perspective, a new wisdom. And I was saying this on an interview prior and you said the word and it triggered it. And it's one of the, it's the last question I want to end on here. Something occurred to me today. When we reach a moment of stagnation or we're idle or we hit the proverbial brick wall, we hit the glass ceiling, you know, pick your euphemism. When we reach some sort of, um, plateau. This is an invitation to transform. That's the incredible thing about being a human being. We create these tools, like you said, you know, about the millionaire and pickup truck. It's a tool. These iPhones, they're tools. These microphones, they're tools. It's what you do with them. That's what makes human beings so amazing. If you look at Elon Musk, I mean, what a brilliant mind to to cultivate the world's greatest engineers to design an electric car, right? Like the ingenuity that goes into this. It's what makes humans special. The other thing, and this is the thought that I had when I was on my hour of power, was when something sucks and things don't feel right, that is a signal to transform. I need to reinvent myself. And so these two words, I was like, I don't see them on the internet enough anymore. We always hear things about marketing and branding and we always hear like kind of the same shit. 
but we don't really hear enough, I don't, in my echo chamber, about transforming, about reinvention. And any time I've got my boots together and I was like, enough is enough, you reinvent yourself. So can you give me some advice or, or share an anecdote on how you, and I want to say recently reinvented something and it transformed either your lifestyle, your relationships, or your business? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I've been doing this for a while. So I would say this. Um, that's a great, I love that question. I absolutely love that question. Transforming. So I would say this. Um, no, I'm not going to say that because that's too good. Uh, what, I would, what I would say is one of the biggest things. And I, okay, here, here's the thing. We, a year ago, went through one of the most difficult times in my life a year ago. I had a couple of deals that went south in real estate, and I had people that went out and went online and just bashed me. People I've never dealt with before, people I haven't even worked with, mm -hmm. went online and bashed me to everything. So literally, a I won't say online bullying, but it was a lot like that. People spreading falsehoods, people saying bad things, and then just a wave of hate coming to me. Very, very difficult time, uh, very depressed. You imagine if you have somebody goes to every like thousands of Facebook groups and posts falsehoods and lies about you and you have to go back and track them down yeah. to try to save. And then you have people that you thought were your friends who read these falsehoods and then decide to believe it and say bad things about you too. Mm -hmm. Total hell on earth for about 90 days, Oof. maybe six months. Okay. Eesh. So I look at that as like, Oof. I could have given up very easily on what I do. I could have um called called it quits and went on to do something else out there but what i did is i just kind of i circled my horses i talked to the, i got rid i literally stopped looking at people that hated me and realized i hey i'm not a bad guy i didn't do anything illegal i just it's real estate everybody has ups and downs no matter what type of it and i will always take care of those people you know just on that note you're talking about the game talking about the rules of wealth talk about monopoly don't people get real butt hurt when they land on your hotel you didn't do nothing wrong. That's the game. It's the game. It's the game. It, Continue, please. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing that that was a big growth transformation. I really died. I, the, my, I would say my podcast saved me. Mm. Is that I said, okay, I'm just going to sit here. We're not going to go out on the road and speak. We're just going to crank out episode after episode. I'm going to double down on the giving. Yeah. Okay. Mm. And recently, literally, I would say within actually at the beginning of all this craziness that happened in, in March and February COVID. I look at it as a time that God actually gave us an extra six months to kind of go, okay, everybody's mm -hmm. dealing with chaos right now. Yep. Everybody's dealing with shit. Here's your opportunity to kind of repivot or turn 90 degrees, maybe not pivot hundred, but, but continue to give, continue to give. So that's what we did. We continue to double down. We mm. embedded our marketing. We've uh, invested in Mar in, in educating ourselves in other markets out mm -hmm. across the country besides Austin and then sharing that information with our network. Mm -hmm. And we've come through this. We're going to, you know, there are a lot of opportunities with what I do with what's going on in the debt game. So we're going to come out of this fine. I'm going to look back at in a year or two years and laugh yeah. about things, you know. Um, but here's the thing. I think God always gives us stuff that we can handle. And a, a uh, before I listened to Tony Robbins, I used to, I loved the chicken scoop for the soul. Mm -hmm. series. You're familiar with that from Jack Canfield and another guy by the name of Mark Victor Hansen. That's right. Okay. And four months ago, a buddy, a fellow podcaster of mine reached out and said, Hey, anybody would like to have Mark Victor Hansen on their podcast. And I'm like, me, 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 me. Cause when I was going through the rough time back 2008 and nine, I was listening to his, a cassette of Mark. I wore it out over and over and over again. I had a chance oh, yeah. to hear him on an interview one time. Talk about that when he filmed that tape series, he was going through the worst time in his life. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Yeah. And so that was one thing that really, I was like, I'm going through the rough time and I'm in a really shitty situation. Let me just double down and, and believe in myself. Know that I'm not these things that people are talking about and that they're hurting right now. We're going to solve that over time. It just can't be fixed like that. Mm -hmm. And so I reached out. I had Mark Victor Hansen on my my podcast. I was re for episode 600. Wow. Um, him and his wife, Crystal, have become friends. They've referred me to probably about 20 other podcasts to be guests on. I've done so the same cool. thing. But their, their their book 
that they that you know, a book to talk about now, which is what you just talk about that we need to ask more, right? Mm -hmm. That's their book. Ask. There, there it is. Wow. There it is, and it's literally mm -hmm. ask the bridge from your dreams to your destiny is just one one question away. And you're asking. Yep. And so that's the biggest thing is when I went going through that, I asked people, I asked my peers, I had my friends and, and colleagues in the real estate that reached out to support me. And, hey, how can we help you? What can we do? You know, we're here to bounce ideas off you. And so that's what I would tell you is is that pivot is sometimes you've got to duck your head down, realize hey, shit's going to hit the fan some cases. Just focus on you and, and come out of that. Not maybe, yes, reinvented in some way, but also more focused. Yeah. Because part of the issue that happened was because I did lose focus on some things. Yep. And I took I took the buck, the young responsible that, hey, everything's the buck stops with me. I'm not going to point fingers. It stops with me. I could have been better. But I've taken what I've learned from my mistakes. And I know I will not repeat those mistakes in the future. And I, I think that's the answer to the question that you're looking for. Very well put, Mr. Carson. Question, where can people find you on the Internet? How can they support you? How can they support what you got going on in the future? Tell them where to go. Uh, best place is just going to our, our website, weclosenotes.com. You can find out our blogs, our videos, our trainings, or you can always go over and listen to the, the, the podcast, The Note Closer Show. Uh, it's anywhere you listen to podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, iTunes, whatever. It's everywhere out there and every platform out there. So give it a listen. But here's the one thing. If you guys are listening to this, go on over and hit the subscribe button for what Knives is doing because we all know Knives is kicking butt and taking names. And hit the subscribe button to Knives and leave him a review. Tell him how much you love this guy. I love his interviews. I love it because when you reached out, hey, I'm looking for a guest. I was like, I might not be a fit because I'm a whole different thing, but yep. I think we can have a great conversation, brother. You're a guy that, you know, you plant the seeds – you give it sunshine, you give it water. I, I, I knew I could tell the moment we met that you were a nurturer and you took podcasts seriously. So I think we're cut from the same ilk, sir. And thank you so much for doing me the honor and, and, do, and getting on this podcast. I appreciate your kind words. Let me know if you need anything, need anything in the future. I'm just a hop, skip and a jump away from you. Amen to that, brother. Same here, man. Anything I can do for you, please don't hesitate to reach out to We got to talk some more. I got some stuff lined up for you. I think it can be helpful too. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, sir. And uh, I'll see you down the road. Never ever believe anything you hear. And believe only half of what you see. And always, 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 forever and ever and ever, put a force field around your heart.